Genetics Lesson 2.3, Meiosis. So last time we talked about what mitosis was, and today we're going to talk about meiosis, which is slightly new, but I promise it's really similar. So essentially, it is mitosis, but it's solely for reproduction or having a baby. So what this means is gamete cells, or the sperm and the egg, must have half the chromosomes of their parent. So somatic cells, so remember those are the body cells, not the gametes, are diploid. And we'll learn a little bit about diploid versus haploid later. Um, they have two copies of each chromosome, one copy of each um, from each parent. And these are what's known as homologous chromosomes. So homologous chromosomes um, are something that we see in meiosis. They are the chromosomes that have genes for the same traits in the same locations. Um, each gene has a particular position on its chromosome. Um, so this is what's called a locus, or for plural, the loci. Um, and the two chromosomes of homologous pair carry genes for the same trait at the same locus. So you can see that's what hap what's happening here. And these are sort of what make us who we are. Speaking of making us who we are, this brings us to genes and alleles. So the genes for a specific trait on each homologous chromosome might not be the same, but the different forms of the same gene are called alleles. So we can see that we have in this picture over here um, genes such as eye color or hair color, but genes can also be something that's not only seen on the outside but on the inside. It could be um, someone could carry the gene for being colorblind. Um, for having or for having a rare skin condition. So it doesn't always have to be something that is extremely visible on the outside. It could be something that is on the inside as well. But in any event, so we look at the gene is the eye color. But the different alleles that you could have is you could have the brown allele, the blue allele, the green allele, or the gray allele. Same thing for hair color. You can have the gene for hair color, but then the different alleles that you could have is the blonde allele, the red allele, the brown allele, or the black allele. So now let's talk about diploid versus haploid. And this is something that you'll see a lot in grade 11 biology. So the cells that have a set of chromosomes from mom and, and a set from dad are diploid. So they have two copies of each. The gametes are haploid, so only one copy of each chromosome. And then meiosis is what creates the haploid gametes. Okay, so let's talk about the stages of meiosis. So just like we talked about the stages of mitosis, they're super similar, except there is some, some significant differences. So meiosis is often referred to as reduction division because the chromosome number is re um, reduced before the sister chromatones are actually divided. So we have two sort of parts to meiosis. So we have meiosis one, which is when the homologous chromosomes separate, and that's all this purple part in there plus this turquoise. And then we have meiosis two, where the sister chromatids separate, and that's sort of this purple part, or this pink part down here, and then plus this turquoise part. But we'll break it all down in just a second. So we start off with um, just before meiosis one. So that's sort of the interface. It's not really happening yet, um, but it does still count as meiosis one. So during interphase, just like in mitosis, the cell replicates its genetic information. So this is referred to as the pre-meiotic S phase. So once again, the sister chromatids are joined by the centromere um, to which the spindle fibers attach. So we can see that happening here. Then next we jump to prophase 1. So just like in mitosis, the chromosomes condense and the nuclear membrane dissolves. So we can see that sort of light purple thing, it dissolves. Um, what sets this stage apart from the homologous chromosomes is that they find each other and they pair up. This is what's known as synapsis and they form a tetrad. So you can see those sort of skin, skinny green and purple lines there, they sort of form together to form these little X shapes and those are what's known as tetrads. So you can see those all along here. Um, the, tetrads, the tetrads 
um, touch at the chiasmata. Um, and here, non-sister chromatids can exchange pieces of themselves in the process called crossing over, which we will learn about in just a few minutes, um, or um, genetic recombination. So this allows for more genetic variation. Next, we have metaphase one. So in metaphase one, the homologous chromosomes in their pairs um, move to the equator of the cell or the center of the cell. So once again, each chromosome is replicated and the replicated chromosomes are joined by the centromere to which the spindle fibers attach. The homologous chromosomes are attached at their chiasmata, which is what holds the pair together at the metaphase plate. Next, we move to anaphase one. So what happens in this phase um, is that the homologous chromosomes um, are pulled to each their own centromere. So they're pulled apart um, by the centromere to the opposite poles. So they're, they're, these ones are pulled over here and these ones are pulled over here to the opposite poles. But the sister chromatones remain attached. So you can see that these little X shapes are still very much intact. Um, and they move because this spindle fiber shortens. So these little yellow wires, they shorten, allowing them to move over here. And last but not least, we have telophase plus cytokinesis. And remember, we sort of consider them one in the same or at the same time because they do happen really close together, if not at the exact same time. So the, homolo the homologs are now separate and each pole is now haploid. Um, each chromosome still has two chromatids and cytokinesis occurs simultaneously. So now the result of this is two haploid daughter cells, which um, is obviously the result, and each with the half number of chromosomes of the parent cells. So this has half the number of chromosomes than this guy. Now we start to move down into meiosis 2, but before that can happen, we have a sort of question mark on the interphase. Um, so some cells may have no interphase after meiosis 1. Um, some cells may have a very short one, or some cells may have a um, period of dormancy before they go into meiosis 2. Um, but it really just depends on the type of cell. Um, and what is happening. But in any case, there is no replication of DNA here. Um, so now we can move on to anaphase one, or anaphase twos. No, sorry. Um, we can move on to prophase two. So it's sort of in reverse. So this way we come this way, and then we come this way. So we have prophase two. So the spindle fiber begins to appear again here, and then um, the spindle fibers attach to the chromosome at their centromere, and they begin to move to the metaphase plate, which brings us to metaphase two. So the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate or the equator, so just like in mitosis. Next, in anaphase 2, the centromeres of the sister chromatids finally separate now, and the sister chromatids of each pair are now independent chromosomes. So over here, we sort of saw these Xs, they were still together, but over here, they sort of break off into the V shape, so they're no longer together in those Xs. The daughter chromosomes move toward the opposite poles, so remember these two opposite ends. And lastly, in telophase and cytokinesis to the nuclei begin to form at opposite poles of the cells, chromosomes unwind and elongate or get longer. And remember that cytokinesis occurs simultaneously. So the end result of all of this is um, the entire process has four daughter cells with, haplo with haploid number of chromosomes. So hopefully that explains to you a little bit more about what meiosis is. So remember before I talked about crossing over. So essentially crossing over is the exchange of parts of non-sister chromatids. It occurs as a chiasmata at the joint tetrad, so remember those X's, and it happens during prophase one. This is also one of the main sources of genetic variation. So you can see um, when those green and the red cross over, the green takes a little bit of that red and the red takes a little bit of that green, so ensuring more genetic variation. Independent assortment is another main source of genetic variation, and essentially what happens here is the align is the random alignment of maternal and paternal, so the mom and dad chromosomes at the metaphase plate. So when things actually start to um, connect together, it's, it's sort of random, and you just get bits and pieces of whichever the mom and dad chromosomes. 
Um, we have something more detail on sperm and meiosis. Um, so I'll just give you a quick overview of what is actually happening here. So in meiosis one, one large cell containing almost all the nutrients and cytoplasm is formed by one small cell. So that's what we call the first polar body. Then in meiosis two, the secondary oxide um, which is um, the egg when it's soon broken down, divides unequally again, and this produces one egg or an ovum and another polar body. So you can see that sort of happening in the diagram here. This is not super important, it's just to give you a sort of an idea of how sperm interacts with meiosis. So now that we've talked about all the different parts of meiosis, and we understand that it's very, very complex. So just like lots of complex things, what if something goes wrong? So if a gamete has the wrong number of chromosomes and, it, um, and an offspring is born or results, the condition is known as an aneuploidy. So if you're born with a, um, a random number of chromosomes, it would be known as an aneuploidy. So an aneuploidy is caused by non-disjunction. A non-disjunction is when homologous chromosomes fail to move apart properly during anaphase one, and the sister chromatids do not separate during anaphase two. So obviously this is very, very bad as you are not ending up with the same number of chromosomes as, a, um, as another human being and most human beings. Um, so you are going to be born differently. So if the offspring results from a gamete that has an extra chromosome, um, it will have three copies of it, a condition known as polysomy. So we can see here in this diagram that every single one of these chromosomes is two, 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 two and then three. So this child will be born with some sort of genetic defect. Um, and there are lots of those. Um, some of them you can't really see, and other ones make a massive difference in the baby's life. So that's all for meiosis.